Dr. Doug Lucas here, dual board certified physician in anti-aging, regenerative medicine, and orthopedic surgery, as well as founder of Optimal Bone Health MD. If you have osteoporosis or osteopenia and you have heard of osteostrong biodensity or osteogenic loading and you're wondering if these are the right thing for you, well stick around because I got to interview Dr. John Jaquish, who is the inventor and designer of the equipment that's used in osteostrong and biodensity. We go through the controversies, we go through the design, why it was created, why he views it as the absolute best and potentially even only tool for building bone. So stick around, we got a lot to go through. So first, I'm going to start with the controversy. So this was brought to my attention actually relatively recently, and I just want to read this statement from the National Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation. That used to be the National Osteoporosis Foundation. And uh, they have a statement on their website that says this. It says that the scientific community has long known the benefits of high-intensity resistance and impact exercise on BMD, bone mineral density. While the high-intensity biodensity exercise program may be beneficial for increasing BMD in adults, the evidence presented does not demonstrate efficacy of the OsteoStrong program on BMD outcomes. Furthermore, we do not know how it compares to the benefits of the current BHOF recommendations for weight-bearing and resistance exercise. Further research is warranted before the benefits of the OsteoStrong program can be determined. So, Clearly, they are stating that they can't really get behind OsteoStrong, I think is a, a nice summary of that statement. And they're saying that the evidence is not good enough. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we shouldn't use it? Well, let's dig in a little bit more. So to understand the basics of OsteoStrong and biodensity, I want to just play excerpts of my interview with Dr. John Jaquish because he talks about sort of where it came from, how he came up with it the backstory behind his mother and how his mother had osteoporosis. And then he created this based off of his engineering knowledge and research, and then how it developed into what we now know as OsteoStrong. So check out this excerpt from our interview on these topics. So the creation of OsteoStrong goes back uh, to, first, my mother was diagnosed with osteoporosis. Uh, she was very upset and she didn't want to take any of the pharmaceuticals because of the side effects. Uh, and she felt like the three things she loved doing were hiking, gardening, um, and playing tennis. And she's like, I, I can't do any of them anymore. And she was just like miserable. And, uh, she was in her early seventies at the time. No, wait a minute. She, she was in her late sixties at the time. Uh, and so I thought, wow, like that's geez, sorry, mom. Like, like, let me learn a little bit more about this. Now at, at that moment, I had no medical training or anything. I was just a highly motivated young person that was in the middle of getting his MBA. Uh, so I started reading on what osteoporosis is and I thought, okay, it's a disease of deconditioning. Well, if it's deconditioning, let's recondition it. Now, I, I was told by my PhD advisor later on down the road that if I had, if I had done my PhD in biomedical engineering before that, I would have talked myself out of this because it's so outrageously unconventional. So I probably benefited from just having a clear mind and approaching the problem from a completely novel standpoint. So I thought, okay, um, how do we build bone density? And I, I researched what the, the activities of children. So if you're ever in a house with hardwood floors and you got some toddlers running around, they sound like elephants. Yeah. And the way they heel strike is very different than the way an adult, and you know, adults, when we sprint, we don't, our heels never touch the ground. We toe strike. And it's to cushion the force. Whereas children look to gain more abrupt force throughout the entire skeletal system and the way they move. And so I came to this discovery and I thought, okay, then I thought I need to find 
the bone density outliers. Who builds the highest level of bone density? Because maybe in what they do, I can figure out how to get my mother uh, to recondition her bone. Maybe I can figure out how, how we can do that. And uh, when I asked myself that question, the answer became obvious because the highest bone density people out there are gymnasts. And it has to do with the way they contact the ground and the forces that they absorb into the bone matrix is sometimes 10 times their body weight. Now, they're also, it's a sport that also has some of the largest injuries. And as an orthopedic surgeon, you're intimately uh, familiar with what I'm talking about. That's right. So the challenge, like I wasn't going to tell my my mother who was, you know, approaching 70 years old, she should become a gymnast. That would not be productive. No. But what I did say was, so I told her what I discovered about gymnasts and she said, okay, that, that makes sense. You know, they're forced through the bone. And there were hundreds of studies on this, by the way. Um, in fact, gymnastics is great because the method in which they contact the ground is very similar uh, with each instance because they injure if they don't contact the ground in an exactly perfect manner, which makes it very easy to study. Not all sports and the contact associated with those sports into the skeletal system is that easy to, to study because it's not necessarily repeatable. So with these gymnasts, the, the answer was like, okay, like what I need to do is give somebody the same benefit of gymnastics without the risks. So let's do impact type loading. So the levels of force that are associated with impact, but we got to take the risk out of it. So we isolate the positions that are normally associated with absorbing impact. And then we allow the individual to slowly place force through the bone mass in what I would call a jig type apparatus. So fixed position, from wherever you're between the two points. So like for the upper body, which is much easier to illustrate here on camera, the positioning where I'm, I got the back of the hand in line with the clavicle and 120 degree angle from upper to lower arm. So that's the way if a human is to trip and fall, that's how they protect themselves. Right. So I take that geometry, I, I put a, a jig type apparatus together where nothing moves but we are capturing the level of force that the individual can create. And I knew that it would remain safe because the individual is creating the force. The device does not place force on the body. So it's like squeezing a fist. Can you squeeze a fist hard enough to break your own finger? Nope. That's right, you cannot. And it's because of a process we have called neural inhibition. Uh, I know you know this, but the listeners oh, probably yeah, don't know. Perfect. So, this is great. Yeah. Neural inhibition is your body's way of saying, okay, we're going to stop allowing you to engage muscle because something bad could happen. It's like if you're sprinting, you're running fast, and all of a sudden in the field, uh, you know, there's a divot and your ankle is like all of a sudden like a little unstable, you slow down. There's nothing you can do about it because your quadriceps and your glutes start to shut off and it's just safe. It's safe for that way. That's your body's way of keeping you safe. So the safety monitoring system is built in within the human body. So all, all I really needed to do was create a robotic system that places everyone in the right position for each time they do these, and I called it osteogenic loading. So I created that term, and that's the name of my first book. And now the whole industry, uh, it's funny, they, the YouTube, not YouTube, uh, um, Wikipedia uh, page, actually, like, it was created to talk about me, and somebody hijacked it, and, and, uh, and I made it all about something else. And, uh, you know, Wikipedia is highly biased. Uh, uh, and it's garbage information. There's, there's really, a, there's a reason that no university allows students to use Wikipedia as a reference because yeah. the information is trash uh -huh. uh, and and highly manipulated. Uh, so, so uh, osteogenic loading, creating force, and I identify four different positions that humans 
would brace for impact. How they protect their abdomen is one of them, how they protect their upper body with their upper extremities, their lower body with their lower extremities, and also how you would induce load on the spine. And so four movements that we identified and then creating the systems and the robotics and the software to manage all of this was uh, was a challenge. And that took a couple of years. And I treated my mother like once, like she had osteoporosis for a couple of years. And then as soon as I started treating her with the device, it, within 18 months, she had the bone density of a 30 year old. She was back to a zero T-score. All right, so I hope you enjoyed hearing why OsteoStrong was created, or at least the equipment behind it was created. Uh, one of the questions that came up for me when we had this initial discussion was, what is the difference between the equipment and biodensity versus OsteoStrong? I've seen them both around, so I wanted to hear this answer directly from Dr. John Jaquish. Yeah, it was optimal to break it up and in different units because uh, the biodensity, it was... Um, it was kind of a one size fits all, you know, like, what? no, I, let me, let me compare it to more like a multi-station exercise device where it's like all exercises are compromised to facilitate right. the other exercises. Right. It, I mean, it's, that, it's, it, I would like, it, it's, it works the same. Yeah. But for those that haven't seen know. it, right. The, the biodensity device is, is a single device. Uh, well, it's just like one big, one big unit, right. Yeah. And then the, the osteo strong versions are individual units where you go around. Right. And the and the biodensity is manual adjustment. Mm. Whereas uh osteo strong is robotic. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. I've I've been on them all, but it's it's been a while. All right. So that seemed to answer that question. And then the next question that we had really was driven around the idea that even the, the BHOF says this, you know, is OsteoStrong better than our current recommendations for resistance training? Because we're doing the same thing. We are recommending that people do resistance training, heavy resistance, impact training when they can. Um, how is OsteoStrong better? And why is it potentially something that could even replace all of this type of uh, exercise and resistance training for both muscles and for bone? So stick around for this one. One of the biggest points of confusion about osteostrong and osteogenic loading in general is for the hip joint. And this is where I was going with talking about the hip joint. Yeah. You need to exceed 4.2 multiples of your own body weight to be relevant and, and trigger bone growth. So like the idea, like as some physician told uh, a woman I know, well, she should start jumping rope. Well, you know, that's maybe 1.2, 1 1.3 mm -hmm. multiples body weight. You don't add those up. Like, right, right. They're not 1.2 it is what you get in one toe strike from jumping rope. And then when you do it again, it's still 1.2. And right. then it's 1.2 again and 1.2 again. It doesn't total. It's, it's, you need to exceed 4.2 in only one loading cycle, by the way. So the body responds to one loading cycle only. Repeated loading cycles make no difference. You just have to have one loading cycle. And there's great research on that. Um, and then the body responds with primary mineralization, which takes about five, uh, five days. And then secondary mineralization, which can take 10 to 30 days. And this is why the, the, the cadence in OsteoStrong is once a week. One time per week, you'll, right. You'll one time around the circuit, you hit each, each movement one time, and that's, that's, right. that's all it takes. And this is some of the feedback I get, which is that can't be enough. So next we're going to get into that statement by the BHOF about the lack of research supporting OsteoStrong. And we're going to get Dr. Jaquish's opinion on that statement and how we should interpret it. But before we do, if you are benefiting from this information, find it interesting and think others would find it helpful, please click the subscribe button. The more people that subscribe, the more likely the algorithm from YouTube is going to recommend this for people that are looking for information about OsteoStrong and about 
uh, osteoporosis in general. Uh, if you want to learn more about other things you can do on your own uh, for osteoporosis and osteopenia and bone health in general, look for the link for our free masterclass in the description below. If you want to talk to one of our team members about our two programs, our full service and our group coaching programs, click this link up here. This will take you to a form where you can get scheduled to talk with one of our team members. And now we have a new ebook and book available on Amazon soon that you can download. So look for the link in the description as well to download our free ebook. It is all about osteoporosis. It's called the Osteoporosis Breakthrough, the natural way to reverse causes of bone loss and build stronger bone. I wrote it myself. I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, let's keep going. All right, so before you hear Dr. Jake Wish's response to the, the BHOF um, statement, let me just review the, the two studies that I have um, read about osteostrong that are in the literature. So this first one is the bigger of the two. It's a 2015 study, and it is a, a, a randomized uh, but not controlled trial. So meaning that they randomized people to the intervention, but there was no control arm. Uh, which is not uncommon in exercise studies. I think something that's nice about the design of this trial is that the mean age was actually a little bit older. So it was 69. So we're not dealing with younger athletes or younger people that are going to have a bigger response to their bone uh, impact and training. These are our 69 year old on average uh, patients that are struggling from osteoporosis. They did the, the trial over the course of 24 weeks. And what they showed, and this is really remarkable, is that they were able to generate what is called a multiple of body weight. So consider your body weight, you know, 150 pounds, uh, a mul two multiples of your body weight would be 300 pounds. So what they were able to do with this equipment was to generate on average, a multiple of body weight 7.2 times in the hip, 7.2 times. That's a lot of weight. Um, and then almost uh, a little, just right under two MOBs in the spine. So a little bit less than the spine, obviously, because you're pushing with your arms and not your legs. Um, but that's a lot of load through the bones. And then they repeated DEXs and they showed a very significant increase uh, in BMD of almost 15% in the hip and a little over 16% in the spine. So a small trial, not randomized, but significant outcomes um, in an age appropriate population. All right, so the second study we have is a pilot study that was actually done by a friend of mine, Dr. Ann Sung. Uh, she works for uh, NASA. And so this was really a, a pilot study on astronauts. So it's a little bit of a different population. Now, what can you draw from this small study? Well, there were increases in bone mineral density, but some of the criticism would be that we didn't really see an increase in the hip or the spine. But you have to remember who this who the patient is in here who the 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 actual subject is this is a younger patient this is a male who probably has really good bone mineral density to begin with um, and so i wouldn't expect that we would see significant increases in bmd because the starting point is probably just too high so we take this for what it is it's a pilot study it showed that there was no harm there was some increase in bmd and then we need more data right that's all that's about all we can say so here's what Dr. Jake, has to say about this comment from the BHOF. So the National Osteoporosis Foundation or whatever they're calling themselves now, uh, they're lying. Uh, and uh, it, it's normal for them to lie because they're funded by pharmaceutical companies. Now, the entire understanding of what bone density is and how it works proves that osteostrong works like w back in i think in the 18 was it 1892 dr julius wolf yeah looked at looked at people who were jumping from high distances and he determined after he had their agreement while they were alive adam signed an agreement while they were alive that after they died he could saw into their bone and photograph uh, their their bones and look at the architecture of the bone and he determined that the people that absorbed higher levels of force through their bone it was farm workers the farm workers they had to jump in and out of the of the wagons and that was about a you know four or five foot drop so they were jumping down four or five feet every day and that led them to have incredibly powerful bone density. 
the rest of the population had much weaker bone density. And so this is the entire basis of understanding of what bone density is, how it functions, how we get it, and how we lose it. Because once we stop loading the bone, about 30 years after you stop loading the bone, you get a dangerously low level of bone mass density. And then you're more likely for a fracture. So every reference they have as to where bone comes from proves osteo strong works so saying there's not enough information would be like saying there's not enough information for them to even have a bone society because they don't know what they're talking about then uh so but but like i said they are funded by pharmaceutical companies only that's where they get all their money so obviously they're going to prefer a drug with side effects over the natural application of force which is their entire basis of their entire practice. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. thanks for that. And I appreciate your honesty. All right. So um, it sounds like there's a little controversy going back and forth between the BHOF and Dr. Jake Wish. And so I, I thought about this comment about um, the BHOF being uh, funded by pharmaceuticals. And so, you know, the good news is, is for um, nonprofit organizations, we can actually see what they report to the IRS as far as uh, where their funding comes from uh, and where that information comes from. And so this is available on their website. And so uh, what you can see here is that for the year ending December 31st, 2022, so last year, you can see that they do have listed royalties and consulting income of uh, a little under $400,000. Um, and that is, you know, not an insignificant portion of their annual budget. So uh, there's a number of other line items there, uh, other ways that they have income coming in. Some of them relatively obvious, but some of them not, like membership dues and grants and contributions, maybe not so obvious. So are they funded by pharmaceuticals? Well, it's really tough to um, take a stand and actually uh, accuse an organization of this uh, without knowing all the details. There's no question that the BHOF is going to be influenced by pharmaceuticals, whether directly by contribution or not, because this is simply an organization that is designed to help educate both people with osteoporosis, but also physicians. And pharmaceutical intervention is part of the traditional medical system. So I don't think you can pull those two apart. The challenge here is to say, you know, would they make recommendations um, that were not pharmaceutical based in a different way? Is, in other words, is there bias here? And I don't think that you can necessarily say that there's intentional bias, um, but I think that you can say that the BHOF is going to recommend drugs because that's what doctors use as tools. And there are holding exercise or physical interventions to the same standard of research that they are holding drugs to. And I think there's a little bit of a flaw here because while there are some good studies on exercise in general, as I've said before, they are smaller studies, not either not well controlled or not controlled with, uh, you know, placebo or some kind of a control group. Um, there are just a lot of challenges there because there is not a significant amount of money to do these types of studies. Pharmaceutical studies have a, a tremendous amount of funding behind them. And you're more likely to see these bigger studies that are blinded, randomized, placebo controlled. It just takes a lot of money and a lot of time. So I don't think that we can necessarily hold a physical intervention like osteostrong or biodensity to the same research standard, although it would be nice to have more research. And the question is, is should we? So should we demand more research before we recommend osteostrong or biodensity to a patient? As a physician, I think it really depends on the patient. So listen to this one last excerpt from this interview where Dr. Jakers will talk about who is the right person for osteostrong, and then we'll go from there. That's a great question. And the answer is not necessarily everybody. You have to be relatively ambulatory. So if someone who's stuck in a wheelchair, not for them. You know, you gotta, you gotta look at different Physical therapy interventions, possibly osteogenic loading is, is very difficult for somebody who can't create force on their own bone. 
uh you know that's unfortunately that that may be the the place where pharmaceuticals might be the only appropriate yeah. uh you know thing thing to discuss unfortunately uh, but you have to be relatively ambulatory you have to be relatively pain free so if you're in acute pain all the time it, it's not going to work uh, because you need to create enough force through each of the long bones of the body that you trigger the response and for the lower extremities there's a lot of research on the hip joint because that's the one that when people fracture, it can affect their mortality in a severe way. All right. So I think now we get the big picture that OsteoStrong was created with the right intention. The equipment is well designed. It can generate a tremendous amount of force, um, which is going to be clearly much more than you can generate through resistance training on your own. So do we recommend this? I do recommend this. I think that it always comes down to, like any intervention, it is a risk-benefit scenario. So what's the risk? Like Dr. Jake Wish said, it's not necessarily for everybody, but if you can generate force and your bones can withstand it, the risk is low. And it's not zero, but the risk is not zero for anything, right? So what's the potential benefit the potential benefit is a massive increase in mineralization response to your bone a massive increase in bone mineral density so does the risk outweigh the benefit or does the benefit outweigh the risk again this is a, a unique and individual situation but i think for a lot of patients if they have access to it it does make sense so would i like to see a large um, randomized controlled trial comparing this Osteo strong type of equipment to a, a control group that does either nothing or a control group uh, that does a, a, a traditional resistance training. Absolutely. That would be amazing. And I think that the outcomes would be really favorable. Obviously, I can't say that for sure. But again, it comes down to a risk benefit scenario. If you want to check this out yourself, look in the description below for a link to a free session at an OsteoStrong location. I have no financial interest in OsteoStrong, but I do think it's worth checking out if you have access to one of these locations or biodensity devices could be uh, similar as well as Dr. Jake Wish said. All right, so that's it. I know this was a bit of a longer video, but the I think the interview really adds a lot to it and hearing these come from Dr. Jake Wish himself. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please click the subscribe button and uh, like and share this with anybody who you think would benefit from it. If you wanna learn more about how you can manage osteoporosis yourself, consider our free masterclass. We run this about every two weeks and you can look for a link in the description below. If you wanna download our new ebook, there's a link for that as well and it should take you to a page where you can download the ebook for free or click on a link to buy the actual physical book from Amazon. And if you wanna to talk to one of our team members about our programs, there's a link for this up here. Click that, you can get scheduled to chat with them. And finally, we do love comments. Please leave comments, questions, thoughts, and ideas for other videos in the comment section below. I'll see you on the next video.